Cashamaniacs. Gearheads. Welcome back to episode 327 of the Geo Gearheads, the weekly show, or well, at least almost weekly. Actually, I think we've done it every week, so we should probably drop the weekly or near weekly uh, show for uh, geolocation, mostly for geocachers. I'm Daryl W4. However, Chris of the Northwest is having some technical issues again, and he will probably be joining us in a little while. But that's fine, because tonight we're going to be talking about mass transit caching with an old friend of ours, Subway Mark. Welcome back. Hey there, it's good to be back. Thanks for inviting me back. Oh, thanks for joining us. And you know, it, it's been, what, like two, three years since we last talked about uh, mass transit caching? It was episode 173, because I looked it up. Wow. Well, yeah, so it's a little over two years, but not quite three. Yep. <laughs> Uh, and, and we'll have you back on at some other time to talk about the uh, um, cruise caching because you've had a lot more experience with that and I know a lot of people are going to be into that. But right now we want to talk about the mass transit caching, the stuff that you can do when you go visit a city or even in your own city without needing a car. And there's even some cool uh, uh, series of caches based yep. around it. But give us a little bit of uh, your experience. What have you done as far as the uh, mass transit caching? So luckily I work in a job that gets me to travel occasionally, which is always nice. Um, so I've cached, you know, I've transit cached, you know, several U.S. cities, uh, but also uh, in in London and, and in Scotland and, and in other par parts of Europe and also Japan. A lot of, a lot of in Japan, because I'd never drive in Japan. You always go by train and walking, and then Singapore. So that's that's kind of the extent of where I've been, which is pretty much almost everywhere except south of the equator. Well, it's it's kind of a good idea if you're in one of these uh, foreign lands to not uh, drive and do the uh, mass transit because you won't have to worry about driving on the wrong side or you know, not uh, knowing a, a traffic signal or sign and something like that. It's you're someone else is driving for you. Yeah, that's the nice part. <laughs> and it helps when you like, it helps when you like trains too. So yeah. Yeah. But you recently made your uh, 4,000th find uh, abroad. Yep. So I was in Tokyo um, in January and I was trying to do 4,000, my 4,000 cash actually in New York for a cash in New York, but it, it, which I was in December, but, I, my cash count wasn't enough, but I lucked out that I was in Tokyo and there's a geocache called Crossing for the Subway because uh, it's a part where the Ginza subway line crosses a street to get into its subway yards. It, it has gates and everything. It's kind of interesting to see a subway go across a side street. Uh, it's located by Reno Station and that was that was number 4,000. Nice. Well, you've also got uh, part of a bigger series, not just the series of caches around here, but most of our listeners will probably know what the uh, sidetracked uh, cache series is. But can you give them just a little rundown of what that is and how your caches fit in? Yeah, sure. So the sidetrack series uh, it starts started in UK, and that's still where most of them are. Probably eighty percent of them are based in the in the UK. Uh, they're they're basically caches highlighting railroad, railroad stations. They're designed for commuters or, or just travelers uh, to get off a train at a station and find a cache that's located with a short walk from the station. Uh, I also own, uh, even before the site, I found out about site track uh, geocaches, I had my own set of series of caches that I called Disappearing Railroad Blues or Reappearing Railroad Blues. Um, but once I found out about sidetrack, that part being part of something bigger, a lot of those caches were actually conducive to become sidetracked instead of instead of what I had here. So I renamed a bunch of them. I also created a bunch. Uh, so I own at least 16 um, that are not all of them are in the database yet, but a lot of them are. 
And so Oregon is not, uh, not Oregon. Oregon's the number one in the United States for side track series, but the United States is number five uh, behind France and Lithuania. But if they would put all mine in, US would be number three behind um, the UK and, and Czech Republic. Cool. Uh, so it's uh, basically just a series of um, caches near train stations. Is that right? Yeah, that's pretty much most of them. So there's there's, there's several parts of sidetracked. Um, so sidetracked means exist existing stations. Um, if it says really sidetracked, it's a station or some other railroad infrastructure that's no longer in use uh, in its former self. Uh, then they also have a sidetrack series called trams. So that's by tram lines, obviously, and then tube, which is what what London calls is their underground subway system. And so there's caches near near those systems, uh, and they they're very persnickety on how you how you call, uh, label your caches because they want to be able to have it come up in lists very easily. Uh, so, but if you follow certain rules, you can publish caches in the sidetrack series pretty easily. And it's it's kind of nice being part of a bigger whole. Uh, and there's there's almost three thousand or more, or maybe even more than that worldwide now. Well, and these are not uh, caches that um, uh, would really stand as a series on their own. They're like one and two here and there, correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So it's not like some of the other uh, series that are out there. Um, like we were talking before show uh, when I was in uh, Minnesota. Uh, for the uh, GeoCoin Fest out there, I did the LRT. Well, I didn't do the whole series. I did some of the LRT caches, which is really cool because it's right off their light rail system. You go get the pass and you jump off, grab the cache from the station. It's right, not at the station. It's like just outside because they don't allow the caches on the grounds of the station. Uh, and then you hop back on and go to the next stop. So you get one of the cards and you ride all day and you find in this case i think it was only 15 caches but there's a bunch of other ones and you were mentioning uh, a san diego trolley line yep san, and, san, san diego i've gotten a couple of those and santa clara which is in san jose california the vta light rail series that um, another one and, and what's, what's nice is you know if the trains are coming every 10 minutes that gives you enough time to pop off find a cache and get another one and then in tokyo uh, there's a one for the Toden Arakawa line. Toden is is just the name of the the transit operator. And Arakawa is a former former uh, tram line that's been upgraded to more light rail standards, but it's it still trundles along in Tokyo and is one at every stop. And some of them are actually on the on the, the platforms, which is seems doesn't go quite towards policy, but they're there. It's Japan. Well, they might so. have been there before uh, the policy was instated too. Or they ignore it. <laughs> this, this is true. It's not like anyone ever does that. No. And the, those trams run every five minutes. So, I mean, it's it literally hop off, sign a log, get back on, which is kind of nice. Yeah, definitely. Uh, White Coaster said that he's also doing a Subway Cash and Dash event in the uh, Toronto area. And they have the uh, TTC Sidetracked uh, series. And he gave us that bookmark list. But it's 15 caches. If anyone's in uh, Toronto, it might be a good way to uh, check out... Uh, a little bit of this, uh, city and the subway, which is always cool. It is cool. There's also one on BART system in San Francisco. But only f the bad part about BART, though, is no, there's no such thing as a day pass. So every time you get off, you have to pay another fare, which is that's a bummer. <laughs> well, and that's something to uh, uh, keep in mind, too, is that a lot of these uh, systems will have some kind of uh, uh, day pass available to anyone. Or sometimes they have visitor passes that are only available to tourists uh, and they're uh, like two, three days sometimes. So you want to check into stuff like that. that that's always my recommendation. You know, before you go, look up the transit system you're going to be riding, see what, what kind of fares they have. A lot of, like they have day passes or such like that. Or um, some places they they have uh, smart cards basically. Um, that they use. So like London has the Oyster card and nice. The great thing about the Oyster card in London, what I like about that is they don't have day passes per se, but they have cap fares for a day. So once, once you've hit a certain fare uh, for the day, that's it. it. You don't pay another fare for the rest of the day. So like, I think if you stay in zones one through four, it's like eight, 
eight pound forty. If you do all six zones, it's like twelve pounds. But and then you're you're free for the rest of the day, which is kind of well, nice. And it's going to be less than you'd pay for parking if you tried to uh, drive around London and park in various lots to go caching or visiting. Exactly, and that's the same with any of these big cities. You know, driving in a lot of cities and parking is a pain. Uh, when you can take a hop on a train or a bus and get around faster and do more things, you know, Seattle's another another great city for for transit that you can get around by by train or by bus. And they don't have capping, but they do have day passes now that you can load on the Orca card. And what these cards are nice is you don't have you 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 get the these um, cards or some of them are now accepting credit cards that have the chips in it where you tap the chip cards and, and, and go this way. You don't have to handle with cash. You don't have to go to a machine, you know, over and over again. You, you just tap this card and go. Uh, so that's what I like to do for the most part, especially like in Japan, a lot of people, I find a lot of foreigners still go and buy paper tickets all the time, even paper day passes, but you can just buy a, one of these chip cards and this tap tap go and it's so much faster and easier and convenient yeah as long as it's not uh, too much more expensive it might be uh, worth doing that just for the uh, ease of not having to deal with the paper card and you know those paper cards tend to be easier to lose as well that's correct or or if they have to go through fair gates if you bend them they may they may jam and stuff like that so that's why i like the the contactless cards are just so much, so much easier. And in complex systems like in in Seattle or in Tokyo, you have multiple transit systems, and they all have their own ticketing systems. But if you use their the contactless cards, it's it doesn't matter. You don't need to worry about it. The card will will figure out the fare for you. The cheapest fare at that. Excellent. That's always a good thing. Then, uh, code. Uh... Oh, I forgot what his name is. Let me scroll back and look again. Uh, Code Junkie. That's what I was thinking it was, but I thought that was wrong. Uh, says Denmark uses a smart card tech, and it was super easy to travel the whole city of uh, Copenhagen on a one on a day pass or on a paper zone uh, via the card. And White Coaster says that uh, Toronto and Vancouver both use the contactless uh, cards. So that's the uh, NFC stuff, which is really handy and i just read last week that i think it's london is actually using uh uh, the apple pay and uh it's not android pay anymore or maybe it isn't they changed the name just a little while ago and i've gotten so confused but the uh, uh, google version of apple pay uh in their uh tube system right they 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 do that new york is is thinking about switching to contactless cards. And when they do that, they're going to allow credit cards or, or Apple pay uh, to, to get through the turnstiles. Well, the nice thing about doing the uh, Apple pay or the Android pay is that you're, you always have your phone, especially for cashers. We're going to keep the phone on us and it's that whole everything in one place. So you're not as likely to lose it. The problem is if something happens, you're just up the Creek. That's that's true. That's very correct. Uh, Wet Coaster says that several cities in Ontario all use the same card system called Presto. Ottawa and Toronto accept the same card. So there you go. You have one card that works uh, for most of the uh, province. And and the, that's really nice because then you don't have to think about it. You just have the card and you go. You just sure. load the car up, card up with money and you're good. Well, in the uh, Easy Pass and iPass system for the tolls uh, out here in Midwest, out to the uh, uh, New England states, are all interchangeable, or not interchangeable, uh, interoperable. And it's the same kind of uh, thing. So that if you go driving from Chicago to New York, you don't need any other transponders. You've got the one that works across all of those systems. And I think I heard Florida just added Easy Pass to their system. So you can use Easy Pass even in Florida now. That's nice. Uh, I think so. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's nice having everything in the one. It just makes it much more convenient. And then you know you can go in your local city, hopefully, and take that same card and go visit someplace, you know, hour away maybe, and go caching there for the day and come back. Exactly. It's 
making it easier is, is the best way. And I think that makes transit open to more people. Definitely. Uh, what about any kind of uh, uh, tools that we might use to figure out where we want to go for stuff that might not be right on the, uh, you know, LRT or whatever series of caches? Yeah. So, um, I mean, you can you, you could have your phone open up to the, you know geocaching app or your or Cashly or whatever app you want to use for geocaching, but um, you can also flip over to there's some transit apps that will give you real time uh, transit. Uh, you know, when, when is the next bus, when is the next train going to arrive? And then it, it'll give you directions on how to do that. The one app that I, I've used is called, of all things, Transit. That's the name of the app. Um, but also Google Maps is doing a pretty good job of doing the same exact thing. So you can do it all in one on, on that. Uh, you just tap it. It'll give you all the buses that are going to stop at that stop, when the next one's coming. And then you can use Transit Directions uh, also via, the, via Google Maps. So that makes it rather convenient. Well, I think Apple actually had bought Transit and integrated that now into Apple Maps because Apple Maps is doing that, but not as wide uh, spread as uh, Google is, I believe. But there was a there is also sometimes uh, apps for that, that specific transit system, so you might want to look into that as well. Right. So it's there. There are several cities have their own. Um, but, and then some cities, a lot of cities, are actually integrating Google Maps into their into their online systems. I know my in my cities, I live in Salem, Oregon, Char Chariots is our bus system. Uh, if you pull up the schedules, it actually is it's using Google as its source uh, for showing you where the bus stops are and, and where the schedules are. So there, there's a lot of partnerships going on. Yeah, which makes sense because then you don't have to uh, reinvent the uh, wheels. Exactly. <laughs> So why don't we talk a little bit about how you plan the uh, caches and what you do for that? So usually I, I just generate pocket queries. I'm still still old fashioned, but also when I travel outside this, the US, it's much easier to set up pocket queries, load them into GPSR. Uh, I also will load them in my phone as well so as a backup. Uh, and basically I just do circle searches. I don't. I don't usually try to do routes because, first of all, pocket query routing doesn't use transit; it uses roads, which is not always the same thing. Uh, so I'll, I'll I also use GSACs, uh, pull geocaches if I want to do a long skinny uh, triangle to follow a route uh, up and down instead of doing a circle. If I want to just do a a quick up and down. I, and usually I'm using it's you know it's overlaid on Google Maps anyway, so and Google Maps shows where the transit lines are, so it it kind of works out well that way. Um, and then you know I I do have a company phone that's uh, I don't have a personal phone. It's actually a company Android phone, Samsung. Uh, but it, I still don't want to use the data because the company will be looking at me pretty badly if I'm using too much data. So I'd rather use my GPSR or do offline uh, on my phone. And when I'm traveling internationally, uh, that becomes even more concern because uh, international is expensive. But luckily, uh, my company uses at and I'm not saying luckily at and has its issues, but <laughs> at and just changed uh, the, their international access. So now if you just turn on your phone and just query either answer a text or use a phone or or ping data it, it goes to ten dollars a day and then it uses your contract limits on for the month of what you have so if you have a, two gigs a month of data then that'll be it'll apply towards that two gigs for ten dollars a day while you travel internationally which is not too bad unless you're traveling you know for a month i guess that gets, racks up the money so then you probably want to get a local sim card but for a week trip, it's not too bad. Well, I think they also have some uh, bigger plans because I seem to remember there was like a fifty dollar, uh, like month long deal for international that they had at one point. It, there was, but AT and T's changed in their plans, and we used yeah. to have that. And my company just informed me just a month ago that we're switching uh, to this plan instead. Mm. I, I think it's it might be a corporate thing. I don't know, uh, but they AT and T also used used to have free, they would give you free access to premium Wi-Fi in a lot of cities. They dropped that effective oh. April 1st. <laughs> nice. 
Yeah, so but so they're using this ten dollar a day instead. Interesting. Now, one of the uh, interesting things, um, you know, we, we're talking about caching the data on the phone, you know, loading it in through the list feature or pocket queries or whatever uh, to get the uh, stuff on the phone and make sure it's there so you don't have to use data. We just had the outage back on Tuesday, I think it was, for uh, geocaching.com. And my uh, uh, Cashly aired out trying to log in and I couldn't use Cashly it wouldn't let me log back in. So I had the uh, local pocket query on my phone. I couldn't get to it because it wouldn't let me log in. Well, that's a new one. Well, that's why I'm still old fashioned. I still have my GPS. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was killing me because it's like, I know I have the GPS. I just wasn't going to uh, you know run home and grab it because I was trying to do a, a cash a day uh, streak. And, you know, we were out when it happened. <laughs> At least I knew roughly where I wanted to go for the cash. That, I couldn't well, that helps, find right? the cash, but I knew it was roughly, you know, it's in this ballpark. So just kept retrying until it let us log in and then I was fine. But yeah, that was an interesting twist that uh, I've never run into before. And it's something to watch out for, I guess. Which yep. I haven't had a chance to uh, uh, email Nick on. How dare he? let that happen to you well i have the feeling there's a bug that never got caught because how often is it that uh, geocaching.com loses their uh, uh servers to handle the authentication yeah they haven't they haven't had downtime in a long time actually well they've had the scheduled downtime but even scheduled. the scheduled downtime usually the authentication still works but for whatever reason, it aired out, and it, uh, it it whenever you tried to log in website or anything, it told you that your login credentials were wrong. So probably what happened is when I tried to use my token, it rejected the token, and then well, let me log in. Uh, yeah, so much not fun. Anyway, but you were mentioning the uh, Wi-Fi, and that's always a great tool, no matter where you are. If you are trying to lose uh, some of that uh, data, you know, the mobile data fee. However, you know, always be careful what you're using. Don't sign on to anything that says, you know, steal my passwords or anything like what? that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so much fun. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> Though I, I've seen a few of those. That, yeah, I just like going to the airport and, you know, when I'm seeing their look around at who has what turned on. And I actually, uh, years and years ago, this is like over a decade ago, I was at the airport when people still didn't understand Wi-Fi. Mm. Someone, and I don't know who it was, had their entire home directory, their entire you know, documents directory open. So I went and put a file on their desktop that said, you might want to turn off file sharing because I can see everything on your hard drive. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> At like six in the morning or something like that. So hopefully they caught the warning, but it's like, I have no idea who it was and I just wanted to give them a nice little friendly, you know, um, something bad could happen if you don't turn off your uh, file sharing. That's why you should say in public space when you're logging the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Locks it out. Uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, Code Junkie is saying that, uh, or is asking on my issue with the uh, token. No, the token had not expired. It failed to log in, and then when I couldn't log in at all. So when I opened the app, it just pinwheeled, and then eventually, you know, I got kicked out. And for for those traveling in Japan, uh, Japan has a lot of Wi-Fi spots, but a lot of them are premium. But there's, they now have a visitor Wi-Fi. Uh, so you have to register with like an email. And I think you have to get a password from a visitor center. And then once you do that, then you can get on a lot of premium Wi-Fis all around Tokyo, at least. I think around the country, too. So that's a trip. I, th <laughs> I think I heard the same thing for like Korea, too. You can do some of that. Uh, Korea also has some like insanely fast Wi-Fi. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of those areas like, um, shoot, it was one of the European cities that I recently talked with someone who had come back 
actually it's probably more like six months ago. And they were saying like everywhere in the downtown area, they had free public Wi-Fi. It was not from the city. It was like sponsored by some other company though. So something to look out for in research before you take off. And then around the U.S., like if you're an Xfinity customer, there's Xfinity Wi-Fi hotspots everywhere. Because every, yeah. if you're an Xfinity customer, your your Wi-Fi is a Xfinity hotspot. So. Right. Which they claim is not using any of your data, and it's not using uh, uh, any of your. It's not giving you access to, or giving them access to your radios. Even there's supposedly there's two separate radios, but yeah, supposedly, yeah. supposedly my mine has. Mine has four radios coming out of it, so. Whatever. Yeah, uh, with Comcast, I'm always a little worried, and you can't actually call them until and opt out of that uh, feature. But most people don't, so use no. it to your advantage. <laughs> most people don't know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And well, and there's a lot of the uh, um, businesses that will have it, and it's actually you know they want that because it's a, a good. Uh, add-on for their customers you know exactly they don't have to provide the uh, uh, free wi-fi if you're an xfinity customer then you know you get the uh, wi-fi for free anyway Uh, but in any case you know if you want to uh, opt out of it you can which you know depending on your uh, opinion of comcast probably uh, colors how you're going to opt in that uh, situation Let's get back to the uh, caching, though. Uh, and you mentioned that you still prefer the GPS. Uh, subway caching, I don't think that's going to work very well, though. It, yeah, your phone might actually work a little bit better uh, because a lot of, even I found in Tokyo, there, and also in New York, I believe, they now have data in the subway tunnels. So if you, there's data, that means your GPS might actually it, you, it won't be your GPS working, but your phone will be using it as, as a proximity to figure out where you're going. Uh, so you'll have a little bit better, but if you want a true lock, yeah, you're not going to get on until you get outside the subway. So doing real time, if you want fast G- GPS, subway geocaching is probably not the best. Um, buses are probably usually the easiest because uh, they have a lot of windows and stuff, and not as much steel. Uh, if you ride electric systems like light rail, you might have a little bit of problem because of the overhead canton area and a lot more steel. I find GPSs and on the phone and in, and in my regular GPS, they're, they're, they're just kind of flying all over the place until you get out. So you might take a while to get, get a lock. Um, mainline trains, uh, probably it's, it's fun to pull out the GPS or your phone and figure out what speed you're going, but its accuracy is, is is not there. But it is fun when you're riding a Shinkansen in, in, in Japan and says, oh, I'm going 186 miles per hour. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've done that on some of the uh, Amtrak uh, uh, rides. And there will be periods where I just lose the uh, position entirely. But other times it works perfectly well. So I, I, I never figured out why that was. But I really appreciate it because it was very entertaining to watch where I am on the uh, uh, Google satellite view. I, I illegally turned a GPS on on, a, on the airplane once, so I I, I was clocking th- 350 miles per hour once. That was kind of nice. Well, I think you're allowed to have the GPS on now. At one now, time you were. Not, yeah, not previously. Now. Right. now you can. Because it's a receive-only uh, radio, I think you're allowed to have it on. You can't have transmitting radios on still but getting a gps lock when you're going that fast is pretty hard (laughs) well and there are some issues with the accuracy of a handheld gps at that altitude right and i i want to say there was something to if you have the barometric uh, altimeter Mm -hmm. that because you're in a pressurized cabin yeah that won't work (laughs) well it yeah the the altitude is going to be wrong but because the uh, altimeter is off I've been told, and I don't remember exactly how this works, but I've been told that it does interfere with your actual location as well. Because I think it's using the barometric pressure to determine height. It's Yeah, it's and using therefore, that. Therefore, it's using the timing of the signal from the GPS. Right, which it, it's not supposed to do that, really. But in order to improve accuracy and performance, I think they're trying to factor that in. So 
it's increasing an error that is unexpected. I think that's what it was doing. So, yeah. But you're not going to be flying between caches very often. So we don't have to worry about it. No, but I did get my longest distance in one day was between Singapore and the U.S. So that makes sense. <laughs> That's an awful long, t- you know, and the, if you're flying west, then you have the advantage of the days being a little longer, too. Well, and going over a dateline really helps. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so much fun. So are there any interesting uh, stories that you'd want to share? Uh, I know you have to take off before too much longer, but any interesting short stories that you might want to share about uh, uh, caching on mass transit? Um, sure. So actually, it, one of them was in Paris. I was use, get, using the metro to get around, and then I was walking down a, a former rail line uh, called the Green, Green Line in in Paris, trying to find a cache. I would, couldn't couldn't really find it because it was over my head. So I went up with an embankment and trying to look and down, see if I could see down. And I could see a cache. And then I saw this other guy kind of walking around. He was doing a little turtle dance, going around and around. It's like, oh, it must be another cacher. So I went down because I actually saw the cache. And then I, I kind of said, you a cacher? And he said, yes, I'm from Italy. It's like, wow, well, so I'm from the US, so you're from Italy, and we're in Paris. And that's kind of cool. <laughs> to get to cash and it that's that's what's fun is when you especially in foreign countries uh meeting other cashers uh from a, from around the world uh, not meaning to so you just happen to be there hunting the same cash at the same time from two different uh uh countries i was gonna say halfway across the world but he wasn't that far no he wasn't that far <laughs> but uh, you know i've I've also gone to events in other countries, which is which is always always fun. And usually, I'm taking a train or a bus to get to those those events. Uh, but they that, haven't been uh, based around mass transit, correct? Um, well, th- that cash was it was based it was on a former no no the the line. events themselves. Oh, the events? No, no, they weren't. See, so I think uh, um, Wet Coaster might have you beat because he's actually putting on a uh, subway event. Well, why and am we I don't not need the there? sandwich shop because <laughs> it's Toronto. That's true. But uh, you, can, actually, you can fly there. That's true. It's every August, I believe the Sidetrack series has a worldwide geocaching events all over. I think it's on August 10th. Oh. And I'm, I'm going to try to throw one in, in my town. Um, so that'll, that'll, that'll be fun. Uh, and they, they try to get people to find caches and stuff like that. But with the new changes in the rules for geocaching, they can't have a geocaching event at the train station. Right. Which is kind and of a bummer. I, I think you can appeal to the uh, reviewer if it's like one of the uh, you know, the like community centers. Then they'll sometimes make exceptions for you if you get the permission you know, at a restaurant or something. But yeah, in general, if it's at a train station or bus station or airport, they will not allow it. So talk to the reviewer. Exactly. And then then I've cashed via transit in Shanghai, in China. Of course, I was by myself, and that's kind of unnerving sometimes, being a foreigner, especially in countries like China or Israel. Uh, Where you don't speak the language? Don't sp- well, in, in China, you just feel really well, out of place yeah china is uh, a little scary just because you know it's china <laughs> uh, although i did joke geoca- no, i did geocache by transit in jerusalem uh that but i only did half the light rail system because one half goes into the occupied territory and uh actually my company told me i was even supposed to be in jerusalem but i went anyway because there was a lot of stabbings going on that week <laughs> oh well but, yeah. but i did find geocaches along the light rail line <laughs> oh my you know I, I've got to go back and check uh, sidetrack see if I even have any uh, uh, sidetrack caches around me last I looked I had none there were no sidetrack caches in this area that's sad but not unexpected uh, until what about two or three years ago it was really only in uh, Europe right All right it's just starting you need to put some out along the new M line. 
Yeah, I don't think that's very likely. <laughs> not to mention, I'm not a big fan of the M line to begin with, but that's what? a different story for it. <laughs> it. It's it's street running, and to make it worse, it's on the uh, uh, edges of the street where the uh, trucks and buses usually park. But then you have the great people mover that goes around circles endlessly. Well, that's that's actually fun. <laughs> that we wanted to just fill with like pizza and turn it into the world's largest pizza pan. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, Detroit things. Sorry, folks. <laughs> All right. Well, I know, Mark, you got to get going pretty soon. So thank you so much for uh, joining us and uh, sharing a little bit about mass transit caching. No problem. I appreciate it. It was good. And we also would like to encourage everyone to spread the word of the Geo Gearheads. If there's a favorite episode, share it with your friends and fellow cashers. Hopefully they'll get some uh, uh, good tips and tricks out of it and maybe even start uh, listening themselves. And we've got a bunch of new shows coming up. Uh, we've got next week a puzzle show with Poker Luck. So we're going to get a different uh, voice on uh, doing puzzles. Then our next randomized show is only uh well i was gonna say two weeks away but it might not be two weeks by the time you listen to it april 19th so if you have anything you want to share on that show make sure to get it in by we'll say the 17th just so that we have time to uh get it in and vet it and hopefully we don't uh, get overloaded on topics again but i love those shows they're so much fun then the land monkey is going to be joining us on the 26th for earth caching then on the 3rd of May, this one is our newest addition to the lineup. We have geocaching competitions, and that's going to be Geo Monkey Tiger, more monkeys, of the uh, Ge uh, Georgia Geocachers Association. And they've actually been doing some of those uh, cool challenge type things that uh, I was talking about on a previous episode. So we're going to have more about that on the randomized show, but then we're going to do a whole show about uh, challenging yourself and partaking in those kind of challenges on May 3rd. So check out all of those on the uh, upcoming schedule. Check the Cache Maniacs website for, at cachemaniacs.com for more on the uh, Geo Gearheads, including show notes for this and of all of our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by emailing geogearheads at cachemaniacs.com or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cache Maniacs shows coming. Please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Cash Maniac shows. Geo Gear His is produced by Chris Sofnauer and Daryl Wanberg. This show is copyright 2018 by Daryl Wanberg. All rights reserved. Cash with the Cash Maniacs.